The Arthurian Cycle by Julius Evola. This is an excerpt from his book, The Mystery of the Grail, Initiation of Magic in the Quest for the Spirit, pages 31 to 37. In all the forms of this legend, the historical reality of Arthur, who was allegedly the Dux Bellarum of the Nordic Chimeras, as they struggled against the Anglo-Saxon between the 5th and 6th century, is secondary compared to the aspect according to which we are led to see in his kingdom an image of the central regal function strictly connected to the Hyperborean tradition to the point that it gained a value as this function in itself with symbolic and supra-historical characters. Thus the relation between Arthur's kingdom and England becomes accidental. In medieval literature, this kingdom had instead a supra-national meaning, and it embraced the best chivalry. The suggestiveness that it exercised on heroic medieval Christianity was so great that a. the latter came to see in Arthur its symbolic leader, and b. the ambition of every knight was to become a member of the mysterious order of King Arthur, which in itself is a particularly significant fact. The name Arthur is acceptable to various interpretations, the most reliable of which attributes to it the Celtic words Arthos, bear, and Viros, man. Nennius had already explained Arthur Latin sunat ursum horribilem. This meaning of a dreadful virile force is connected with a symbolism of Hyperborean origin and at the same time points to the idea of a central or polar function. In fact, the bear is one of the sacred symbols of the ancient Nordic cult and simultaneously in astronomic symbolism corresponds to the polar constellation Ursa Major. Moreover, in the corpus of traditional texts, symbols and names eventually establish a relation between this constellation with the symbolism of the pole or the centre referred to it and Thule, a name designating the Hyperborean. White Island, the traditional centre. Thus, the polar, the Hyperborean, and the regal elements converge in the figure of Arthur. The unilaterally virile and warrior aspect that could be supposed in Arthur as an Urus Horribilis is also modified in the legend of Arthur's being always accompanied as some kind of complement or counterpart by Merdin or Merlin who holds a spiritual knowledge and power. This Merlin seems less a distinct person and more the personification of the transcendent and spiritual side of Arthur himself. The strict connection between the warrior and the spiritual principles already characterizes the chivalry of King Arthur's court, as well as the meaning of most typical adventures attributed to its members. The Knights of the Round Table, that is, of King Arthur, are not mere warriors. And when they are shown to be the Fellowship of the Round Table, they think themselves more blessed and more in worship than if they got half the world. And ye have seen what they have lost their fathers and mothers and all their kin, and their wives, and their children, for to be of the fellowship. The grail itself may represent the transcendent element by which this knighthood aspired to be complemented. This will be clearly seen in the versions of the legend in which Arthur's kingdom is confused with the grails. At this point it may be worth recalling the episode concerning the Stones of Stonehenge, 
which still exist and are a source of interest and bewilderment. Since it is a mystery how these gigantic blocks could have been cut and carried so long ago to the place where they have been found. These stones appear to be the remains of a great solar temple dating back to the Megalithic or to the Neolithic. Merlin, by ordering his warriors to go fetch such huge stones from the faraway peaks, says, Go to work, brave warriors, and learn by rolling forward these stones where the physical strength surpasses the spirit or whether the spirit surpasses physical strength. The warriors prove unable to do this, but Merlin is able to accomplish this task laughingly and effortlessly. That the warrior virtue had in the Arthurian cycle, a spiritual reference point, can be seen from this exhortation in the same text, the Historia Regum Britannia. Fight on! for your own land, and even welcome death, if necessary, for death is a victory and the liberation of the soul. This is exactly the ancient view of the Mors Triumphalis, which is a main feature of the ethics of heroic traditions. According to the legend, Arthur demonstrated this innate right to be the legitimate king of all England by passing the so-called test of the sword, namely by successfully taking the sword out of a great quadrangular stone on the altar of the temple, obviously a variation of the stone of kings that belonged to the ancient tradition of the Tuatha de Danan. Here we find a double convergent symbolism on the one hand, we have the general symbolism of the foundation stone, which hints at the polar idea. Thus, the allegory and the myth allegedly refer to a virile power, that is, the sword, that needs to be drawn from that principle. On the other hand, to take the sword out of the stone may also signify the freeing of a certain power from matter, since the stone often represents this meaning. This also agrees with another episode in the legend, that in which Arthur, led by Merlin, seizes the sword Caliburn or Excalibur, which is held by a mysterious arm hovering over the waters. But this weapon, forged in Avalon, is related to the supreme centre. Its being held above the water symbolises a force detached from the conditions of the material passional and contingent life, to which a fundamental aspect of the symbolism of water always referred. Such a life must always be overcome, not only by those who yearn to receive a regal mandate from the centre and become leaders of men in a higher sense, but also by every knight who wants to be worthy of belonging to the followers of Arthur and ultimately to find the Grail again. Among the themes proper to ancient Britannic tradition, I will mention again the institution of the round table and the symbolism of King Arthur's seat. Concerning the latter, we often find the recurrence of the famous symbols of the inaccessible land. According to Andrea Capalano, Arthur's is a kingdom separated from the human world by a large river and it can be accessed only by crossing a dangerous bridge. This kingdom is defined by giants. In it there is a castle that is constantly revolving. In this castle, which is called Regal Castle, Car Rigor, or Rich Men's Castle, Car Gulad, there is a supernatural vessel that, according to the tradition of the spoiling of Anwen, was taken by King Arthur from a king of the other world. This vessel, which, like the grail in the castle of the rich king, is a facsimile of the vessel da Dajde, one of the symbols proper to the Hyperborean tradition of Tuatha de Danan. Satiates from glass equals vitrum 
and Buria equals Civitas, or Glastaberia. The story of Arthur's donation of the island to the church is some kind of excuse for a traditional succession fabricated by Christian ministries. Nor did the forgery end there. In reference to the above-mentioned tragic epilogue of the ancient island, it was claimed that Arthur died and that his sepulchre was located in Glastonbury. Thus the ancient centre was retained, this time with a new meaning of the centre of missionary Christianity. Second, while Arthur is attempting to realise his legendary world empire and to conquer even Rome in order to be crowned emperor therein, his nephew Modred, who remained at home, usurps the throne and takes possession of Arthur's woman, Guinevere. In the war that ensues, the traitor is killed, but the best knights of the round table also die. Arthur himself is mortally wounded. He is taken to Avalon, that the health restoring techniques of the woman inhabiting that land, especially Morgana's, may heal him and allow him to resume his function. But Arthur's wounds, especially the one produced by a poisoned spear, according to some writers, open up again every year while his faithful subject at home vainly await his return. There is a tradition, however, according to which one day Arthur will return from Avalon to resume his reign. This is why the Britons, since then, never wanted to appoint another king. In other forms of the legend, for instance in the Otria Imperiala by Giviesus of Tilbury, Arthur is portrayed lying in bed in a wonderful palace located on top of a mountain. According to another version, which is tendentially Christian, Arthur has died and his body has been buried in the Abbey of Glastonbury, which, as we have seen, was portrayed as Avalon itself. All this may be referred to a crisis uh, and to an interregnum that will be followed by the quest of the Grail. In the meantime, we have identified another fundamental theme in the Grail cycle, the wounded king who waits to be healed in an inaccessible and mysterious seat so that he may return once again. We should recall likewise the other pre-existent theme in the Celtic saga, namely the kingdom stricken by devastation and by barrenness owing to the plebeian revolt or to the king's wound caused by a spear or a flaming sword. And that is the end of the chapter. So long for now, friends.